Okay, so this recipe is ready. We have our beautiful slow cooker, whoa, steamed up glasses. Can't see. If you're a fan of ATK, you know we love the Instant Pot, the multi-cooker that pressure cooks, slow cooks, sears, and more. You also know we love Dutch ovens. Well, Instant Pot recently came out with a mashup. It's called the Instant Pot Precision Six Quart Dutch Oven, and it's combining a Dutch oven and a slow cooker in one. Does this combo product actually work? Should you be kicking your slow cooker and your Dutch oven to the curb? We put them to the test to find out, and we're gonna compare them today so you can decide which product is right for you. First up, Hannah with the slow cooker and the Dutch oven. All right, so first up, Dutch ovens. Now, if you have been following us for a while, we have probably talked your ear off about Dutch ovens already. And that is because these are one of the busiest pots in our kitchen. If I were cast upon a desert island, I would definitely take a Dutch oven as my one tool. Some of you might say an ax is more important, but look at you can literally be cracking coconuts open with one of these things. I personally did our Dutch oven testing. I have the pipes to prove it. I have our winner here from Le Creuset and our best buy from Cuisinart. There is a huge price difference between these these two pots. Um, Le Creuset is definitely way more expensive. Um, the difference really comes down to longevity. You know, this is a generational pot. You will pass this pot down. This is more prone to chipping. But beyond that, these two really excelled over everything else we tested. And we did all kinds of things. You know, I seared meatballs, an acidic tomato sauce. We made fluffy white rice. Bread is another thing we love to make in a Dutch oven. These basically, you know, the insulation of the cast iron, it makes a tiny little oven inside your oven, you can see here, and it really makes delicious bread with a super crispy crust, which is just fantastic. We tested these two models against a huge range of other Dutch ovens. We considered all different materials. This was our preferred material, but we also looked at stoneware, you know, basically ceramic ones. I literally broke the lid of the Emile Henri that I tested when I just, I just put, put it back on. I wasn't even in a bad mood. I didn't slam it, placed it back on there and I cracked it. You know, for something, especially if you're considering making an investment, um, you really want it to last. And so stoneware, ceramic, that style was out for us. Enameled cast iron really was our material of choice. And the cast iron was important because it really radiates the heat out. You can get a nice, beautiful, even sear. But the enamel was just as important. We tested a regular cast iron version of these. And while it was fantastic for bread, it got the most caramely brown, crackly crust because that black color was really, really uh, absorbs and radiates the heat. But beyond that, it wasn't as easy to clean. You have to maintain it like a cast iron skillet. You know, you have to oil it. Um, you also have to be careful with acidic sauces, tomatoes, things like that. We actually deep fried in it after cooking a tomato sauce and we could taste a little bit of a metallic tinge in some of the um, French fries, which is not delicious. And while we do love regular cast iron, for a Dutch oven, unless you're only baking bread in it, we think that enamel just makes it a little bit easier to use. You don't have the maintenance and you don't have to worry about the, um, the finish interacting with your food at all. Enamel is essentially glass. It is a non-reactive layer. It goes all the way around on the outside of the pan. Um, it does make them a little prone to chipping. You know, if you have a beautiful Le Creuset, I would recommend not slamming your spoon on the rim to clear it. Although one reason the Le Creuset was more durable than other models we tested was it has this rim here that's a little wider. It has a section that's uncoated, so it doesn't have the enamel at the very top of the rim. And this means like if you slam a spoon down, it has a surface that it can hit that's not gonna chip something. Now these are not light pieces of equipment. But some of them, for example, we tested this model from Lodge, it was almost 20 pounds. I think this is like 16.8, not light at all. We actually have a whole separate testing of lightweight Dutch ovens as if weight is a real concern for you, which is very valid um, because 16 pounds is a lot, but it's lighter than some of the other options. So you still get that beautiful cast iron that retains that heat, but at slightly more maneuverable weight, which was really useful. Next, let's talk about the cooking surface. So, Inside here, you will see these two pots share fairly similar shapes. They have low, straight sides and really broad cooking surfaces. 
Now this means that you can do more. For example, when I was like searing off the meatballs or searing off the beef for the boeuf bourguignon, you can do two batches instead of three, which saves literally like 15 minutes. Another factor is the light interior. You'll see inside here, both of these have light insides, and this just helps with visibility. Staub, for example, another gorgeous, quite expensive Dutch oven, has a black interior, and if you are searing, you actually can't see the little halo around the meat to, to tell, is this starting to brown into a gorgeous caramel crust, or is this starting to blacken? So a light interior, while the Staub still is a gorgeous pan, a light interior on our winners here just helps with that visibility. You can see the degree to which your food is cooking a little more easily. Next, let's talk handles. As I said, <coughs> these things are heavy which means they can be hard to carry. And you really want, as you're often moving these in and out of the oven, you want to be able to hold them with big, bulky pot holders. So broad, looped handles are really important. Some of these have tabs, little tabs, and we literally were like pinching for dear life, holding this huge, heavy stew. You know, it was kind of stressful, very stressful. Um, whereas these, you could wrap your hand fully around them, even with a pot holder, to feel like you were carrying it very securely, which really, really mattered when you have a whole hot thing that you've been working on for hours and hours and hours and you do not want to drop it, that's for sure. So now we're going to check out slow cookers, the other core piece of equipment that the instant Dutch oven claims to replace. A slow cooker promises to be a little fantasy grandmother cooking away all day in the kitchen while you are elsewhere doing whatever you want. But that dream can be dashed if you don't have a good model and you come home to food that is either not good or not ready when you are to eat. And that is a major problem and makes a slow cooker not worth it at all. So buying the right brand really mattered. And what determined a good slow cooker was actually super interesting. Now we tested a whole fleet of slow cookers. We really like them. We've got a bunch of books about them. In our testing, we tried all different dishes in these things. Everything from Thai coconut chicken curry to the classic pot roast. The performance though in the slow cookers we tested was hugely variable. Pot roast, for example, is something we like to use this recipe in testing because it's really telling. Some of the slow cookers produced pot roast that were still like rock hard, chewy on one side and mushy on the other. Um, some of them were just mushy all throughout. Some of them were super tough. You know, we saw the, the full gamut. So what were the differences? What made a successful slow cooker? It came down to a couple things. We partnered with MIT to figure out why some of these slow cookers were better than others. We actually tore all these products apart, looked at the inside, looked at the guts, and figured out what makes a successful slow cooker. And it came down to a few things. First of all, most models have a traditional ceramic stoneware crock like this that absorbs heat and distributes it slowly. Um, these models have heating elements that wrap around the outside. It's a combination of nickel and chromium called nichrome. And these heating elements were prone to hot spots, typically on the, the, on the ends right here where they were concentrated. Well, guess what? Where the heating elements were, we got hot spots. And that means cool spots here, which equals unevenly cooked food, which is not good. Our winner, on the other hand, was able to transmit heat more evenly throughout the entire cooking chamber, which resulted in better food. Another quality successful slow cooker shared was having a double layer of insulation. Now this did two things. The insulation, again, also helps buffer the heat a little bit, slow it down, distribute it more evenly, and it also helps the heat be more productive. It's keeping it here, cooking it, so it's not going off into the air and, and wasting your energy. Um, so it's not only you know, more even, it's also more efficient. And the last thing we really appreciated in a slow cooker was a temperature sensor. Now this just tells the pot when it's getting too hot, so it shuts off. Now some of these things would actually just like rage and bubble away and just boil your food into oblivion. You know, this is just an added bit of intelligence. So the machine knows, whoops, I'm getting too hot. I'm going to back off a bit. Whoops, I'm not hot enough. I'm going to turn it up a little bit. We looked at models with a six to seven quart stated capacity. These can cook smaller amounts. They can cook bigger amounts. They can do it all. All right, the next thing, an oval shape. We really like this. You can fit ribs. You can fit a roast. An oval shape allowed you to do more. Again, it's back to a versatility thing. Another factor that we found really important was digital controls. We really prefer digital models. I'm going to turn this one on right here right now. 
super responsive. It has that audible alert, which we really appreciate as well. And then really clear digital buttons, so you know at a glance what the machine is doing. You want low, you just hit the low button. You want high, you hit the high button. It's very simple, very straightforward. And so for us, digital controls were where it's at. Another thing that really mattered, handles. You want big, roomy, comfortable handles. You know, these are quite heavy. We want to make sure we can hold them securely with oven mitts on if we need to. And big handles were definitely a plus. Lids. You'll notice this has a glass lid. We actually really love this feature because you can peek in and check the status of your food without opening the lid. When you open a slow cooker lid and peek in, you are t dropping the temperatures, causing the temperature to drop, which causes the cook time to elongate. So if you said, oh, it's going to take me five hours, but you've been peek it in there, you know, every half hour, it's probably gonna take six hours, maybe seven hours, then maybe you're gonna be, you know, late for dinner and everybody's gonna be all cranky. If you're looking, you ain't cooking. <laughs> <laughs> we have some gorgeous braised short ribs in here. Check this out. Meat cuts that tend to be a little tough, you know, this long, slow, gentle cooking over time really renders them nice and tender. So there you go. We love Dutch ovens. We love slow cookers. How do these two compare to the Instant Pot Precision Dutch oven, and can it actually replace these two very core pieces of equipment in our kitchen? Let's go to Lisa to find out. Basically, this is a regular enameled cast iron Dutch oven, and it's set over a base that provides heat. Now, you can use the Dutch oven just as you would our regular Dutch oven, or you can put it in this base and then it becomes a slow cooker. The controls offer four different functions. You can sear and saute, you can slow cook, you can braise, and you can use it manually. Now that lets you set this, the temperature in increments from 204 degrees to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. It also has automatic shut off and a timer. So when the timer goes off, it turns off. This pot claims that it can do these functions of sear and saute, braise, and slow cook. Our recipe for slow cooker braised short ribs hits all of those functions in one recipe. So I'm gonna show you that. Um, and normally we don't in this recipe call for browning the short ribs before cooking, but we do that in a lot of our slow cooker recipes because you know if you just dump stuff in and turn it on, it doesn't have the flavor development you get from searing it first and getting that Maillard reaction, the browning, that really helps make it taste much deeper and richer. So the nice thing about this pot is is that you can sear and saute in it. It's a cast iron pot over heat, and you can turn this on and you can actually you know, start recipes by browning in this pot. A lot of slow cookers can't handle that. So let's go. Now one of the things about this pot that we don't really love in our other pots, as you saw with Hannah, they're all light colored inside. This one is black. It's a little bit of a disadvantage because it's hard to judge browning. And that's something that we really love to be able to see is we like a lighter color contrast inside the pot. But you know what? Let's see how it works otherwise. I'm going to turn the control and I'm going to have it turn it on. Hello, wake up. OK. Sear saute. And I'm just going to hit start. So when you turn on the sear or saute function, it preheats, which is nice because, you know, when you're going to cook something in a skillet on the stove, you have to be uh, aware that you need to preheat the oil or the pan before you add food. Otherwise, it's just, you know, going to sit there and, you know, steam instead of brown. So there's a little progress bar across the front. It says preheating, and that flashes and when it's done. So this gives you a nice, helpful you know, assistant in knowing when to add the food. You don't want to put it in right away while it's still cold. You want to let it preheat and then you'll get a nice sizzle. Oop, there it is, it beeped. It beeped and that lets me know that it's now hot and ready to go, right? It's beeping and it's telling me, okay, add food, add food. Thanks, little pot. Okay. And you can hear that nice sizzle because the pot is hot. Now, even though the interior of this is black, that is still cast, that's enamel on the cast iron. Um, it's just a black color. It is a little bit harder because we like to see the contrast with a light colored pan so you can really judge how brown things are getting. If you're making a stew or something in here and you brown things too much and burn them, it's hard to tell in a black background. And once you've got that burned taste in there, your whole stew or soup is gonna taste burned. So you have to take this out, clean it, and start over. 
and you just don't have the signals you get when the interior is light colored. So even though our favorite Dutch ovens have this cream color inside that can get kind of stainy and stuff, it's still way better than a solid dark black pot. So one of the things we do love about this is that this is cast iron. So cast iron is beautiful at, you know, gathering heat and retaining it and radiating it back on the food and not cooling off too much when the food is added, just like your cast iron skillet uh, or our favorite Dutch oven. So when you're trying to sear and brown in this, it's much more successful in general than in your typical ceramic crock. This cast iron is gonna hold the heat better and it's gonna be able to sear better than most ceramic based crocks in slow cookers. So you can definitely hear that sizzling and we're getting some decent browning. So let's take a look. Yeah, they're starting to brown nicely. You can see that. This is the kind of browning that you get with cast iron. It's not like a, a wimpy, you know, weak little amount of browning. It's, it's real searing. So searing on this one, A plus. Okay, so these are looking pretty good. We've got some nice browning on these. It's, it doesn't have to be super, you're not trying to cook them through. You're just trying to get some nice browning on the surface. And that's going to leave some nice fond in the bottom. So I'm, I'm going to take these out so we can add the ingredients for the braising liquid. And then we'll put them back in. So here comes some chicken broth. I've got some white parts of the scallion. This is hoisin sauce, be really delicious, flavorful, sweet, complex. Here comes the chili garlic sauce. Finally, some tapioca, which works to really thicken it up and give it some nice body. Ah, uh, this smells amazing. So the goal of braising in general is that you are simmering a liquid and you're partially submerging a protein, usually uh, like beef, in that liquid and you are gonna cook it with that liquid and it becomes very flavorful, it cooks very gently, and um, that is just you know, gonna make it really delicious without drying it out and it creates a beautiful sauce. So I'm just kind of turning them around in the sauce so they're coated in it, but I'm sitting them in there, they're sticking up and I'm gonna cover it and that's just gonna simmer in there and cook beautifully. So this is our braising portion. Switch over to slow cook and then start. While the short ribs are slow cooking, I'm gonna talk about a little bit of what we found in testing because we made a lot of different recipes. This is just a cast iron Dutch oven in a heating base. And a lot of the gripes that we had were really around the slow cooking. And as I said, it has one slow cooker setting. And so that kind of bothered us, that imprecision. Um, and you have to, you know, every recipe you try, you're gonna have to sort of feel your way through which setting, which amount of time you should cook it on. Other things we were not crazy about. If you wanna adjust the temperature, even on the manual control, if you wanna, you know, turn it up higher or lower, you can't just adjust it. You have to shut it off and turn it back on again to the setting you want. So that thing where you have to like stop, turn it off and start it over instead of just adjusting a temperature, a little bit annoying. Our favorite slow cookers are oval, and that lets you do like a long piece of brisket or something that's a, you know, a long, elongated size. And it's, you know, it's so much more space to be able to spread out. This is round. This is just eight and a half inches across the flat cooking surface on the bottom. Whereas our Le Creuset winner is nine and a half inches and the uh, Cuisinart is actually 10 inches across the base. Eight and a half to nine and a half or 10 inches doesn't sound like a lot, but it actually makes a huge difference. Okay, so this recipe is ready. We have our beautiful slow cooker. Whoa, steamed up glasses, can't see. Um, <laughs> we've got our beautiful slow cooker braised short ribs. Oh my goodness, look at this, really gorgeous. There we go. Oh my goodness, this looks so good. Okay, so there is a gorgeous sauce on here. This is one of the benefits of a nice braise, this beautiful, thickened, almost candied sauce. It's so delicious. Sprinkle a little bit of these chopped greens from the scallions that we had in the sauce over the top. And we are ready to go. Look at this. Beautiful. This is so good. It's so juicy and moist. The sauce is just sweet and spicy and just beautiful. It tastes just like you'd want it to be. Um, just comforting and 
hearty. It's really delicious. So I'm just gonna excuse me while I eat the rest of this. <laughs> the instant precision six quart Dutch oven did a nice job with searing, with sauteing, braising, slow cooking. Does this replace our winning Dutch oven and slow cooker? Well, you know, maybe. We really like this. It does a nice job in what it does. But as I pointed out earlier, we had a few quibbles with the way it operates. That said, does a pretty good job. There are still things that particularly our slow cooker can do that this can't. And it's not the ideal Dutch oven either. But if you're in the market for both of those products at once, maybe you have limited space, this might not be a bad option. It's a little bit more expensive than if you bought our winning slow cooker and our best buy Dutch oven. That said, there is, as I pointed out, a learning curve with this product. And at ATK, we're not big fans of learning curves. We want you to have success right away. So yes, there is that little bit of a disadvantage, but overall, not a bad choice. So what do you think? Would you get an Instant Pot Precision Dutch Oven or would you stick with a Dutch Oven and a slow cooker? Let us know in the comments below. And for more information about all the gear we talked about today, check out the links below or go to americastestkitchen.com.